Welcome to this playlist, which is devoted to an analysis and an understanding of the Second Vatican Council. The installments of this playlist are numbered, so I suggest that you watch them in numerical order. They'll probably make a little bit more sense that way. As you know, we've been discussing the Council's document on the Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium. Let's take a look at the 33rd article of the document. It says something that is very, very true. Although the sacred liturgy is above all things the worship of the divine majesty, it likewise contains much instruction for the faithful. So, Sacrosanctum Concilium says that the worship of God is the most important element of the liturgy. In light of that, do you think it's a bit odd that Article 14 of the very same document says, in the restoration and promotion of the sacred liturgy, this full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered before all else. Do these two articles contradict one another? Well, at the very least, they don't seem to be very consistent with one another. So we have to ask ourselves, did the Council Fathers have anyone proofread Sacrosanctum Concilium before they approved it? You'd think so, but then again, there are a lot of other problems with the document. Well, for instance, Article 14 is more problematic than just the fact that it seems to contradict Article 33. Article 14 seems to mandate a change in the nature of the Mass. You see, the Latin Mass is God-centered. It carries out Jesus' command to sacrifice the Mass in memory of Him. On the other hand, the Novus Ordo Mass is more man-centered. The new Mass is a severe rupture from the past with its overemphasis on community in the area of the purpose for the Mass. The ultimate purpose for the Mass is the sacrifice of praise rendered to the Holy Trinity. That's the ultimate purpose. The ordinary purpose of the Mass is to make satisfaction to God for sin. That's what Catholic theology has always maintained. The new Mass stresses the nourishment and the sanctification of the faithful. Old Mass, old Mass, worship and adoration to the Holy Trinity, the removal of sin. Here, hey, we're all nourished and getting along together. Two entirely different structures here. Objection. An awful lot of Catholics, most of the world, is under the impression that when Vatican II finished up doing what Vatican II does, uh, you know, we got rid of Latin, we got rid of, uh, you know, uh, altar boys, we, you know, ripped out communion rails. Vatican II said to get rid of all the statues, go hide Jesus in the tabernacle somewhere. And that's what people's perception is. I mean, obviously, you're a parish priest. You know that's what people's perceptions are. <laughs> so much of that, yes. <laughs> but, but is that what Vatican II actually did? Oh, no, not at all, not at all. But, you know, we, we constantly hear the talk of the spirit of Vatican II, and, uh, and I find that the spirit, the so-called spirit of Vatican II all too frequently conflicts with the actual letter of Vatican II. I answer that the letter of Vatican II, as exemplified by Article 14, signals the introduction of a man-centered mass. It flat out states that the full and active participation of all the people is the aim to be considered before all else. As we discussed, there's a legal phrase, res ipsa loquitur, the thing speaks for itself. In addition to that, Article 31 indicates that the Mass would be changed to accommodate more speaking parts for the congregation. The revision of the liturgical books must carefully attend to the provision of rubrics also for the people's parts. Well, the Council Fathers weren't satisfied in just changing the Mass into a man-centered liturgy. It also wanted to change churches into man-centered buildings. And when churches are built, let great care be taken that they be suitable for the celebration of liturgical services and for the active participation of the faithful. We'll discuss the modern phenomenon of ugly churches in a future installment. Earlier in this installment, we discussed a seeming contradiction between two articles of Sacrosanctum Concilium. It isn't the only contradiction. Article 55 says, The dogmatic principles which were laid down by the Council of Trent remain intact. 
As you probably recall, the seventh session of the Council of Trent dogmatically declared, if anyone says that the received and approved rites of the Catholic Church accustomed to be used in the administration of the sacraments may be despised or omitted by the ministers without sin at their pleasure, or may be changed by any pastor of the churches, whomsoever to other new ones, let him be anathema. Article 55 of Sacrosanctum Concilium suggests that the Second Vatican Council would abide by the Council of Trent's dogmatic decrees. Yet Article 21 of Sacrosanctum Concilium says, for the liturgy is made up of immutable elements, divinely instituted, and of elements subject to change. These not only may, but ought to be changed with the passage of time, if they have suffered from the intrusion of anything out of harmony with the inner nature of the liturgy, or have become unsuited to it. It seems that Article 21 authorizes the Mass to be changed to other new liturgies in defiance of the dogmatic principles of the Council of Trent. Also, the last part of that second sentence is worth mentioning. What does having suffered from the intrusion of anything out of harmony with the inner nature of the liturgy mean? If you have any ideas about what it means, please post them below. Maybe it's just a poor translation, but it sort of sounds like gibberish. Houston, we have a problem. But wait, there's more. Article 40 says, To ensure that adaptations may be made with all the circumspection that they demand, the Apostolic See will grant power, as the case requires, the necessary preliminary experiments over a determined period of time along with certain groups suited for the purpose. So the Second Vatican Council authorized experimentation with the liturgy, and the authorization was repeated in Article 44. The Commission is to regulate pastoral liturgical action throughout the territory and to promote studies and necessary experiments whenever there is a question of adaptations to be proposed to the Apostolic See. So at what point do we stop blaming all the liturgical abuses on a faceless phantom spirit of Vatican II instead of laying it at the feet of Vatican II itself where the blame properly belongs? Did the fathers of the Second Vatican Council intend to change dogma? Well, if they didn't, they should have read Article 128 more closely. Laws which seem less suited to the Reformed liturgy are to be brought into harmony with it, or else abolished, and any which are helpful to be retained, if already in use, or introduced where they are lacking. I'll leave this on the screen for a while for you to ponder, but maybe some of the Council Fathers believe that the laws referred to in this article would only involve church discipline, but this language seems pretty extreme. As it turns out, the post-conciliar church did attempt to change a great deal of dogma beyond just the liturgy, and we're going to discuss those in future installments. But before we discuss them, there are still more problems with Sacrosanctum Concilium that we need to discuss, so we'll be back again in about a week with another installment. In the meantime, please consider liking our Facebook page. The link for that is down below in the comments section. Also, this Sunday, you, if you have a choice between driving one hour to a Latin Mass or driving five or ten minutes to a Novus Ordo Mass, please consider choosing the Latin Mass. In regard to the Novus Ordo Mass, unless there's absolutely no other option, and sometimes there isn't, please don't go. Baby, please don't go.